Hi, my name is Barry Sterling Mitchell. I produce the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings and the Bias Plus Reports. And this is Ben and Barry on football. Hello out there. This is Ben Dickerson, your co-host. Great super wild card weekend. Really great games. Things turned out almost like I expected them to, but it's extremely exciting. Also, uh, we're doing this video a little earlier this week because I will be leaving tomorrow for Winter Haven, Florida to take a team down to the flag football national championships. I will be coaching a 35 and over team. Philadelphia will also be represented in division one, division two and division three. So traveling to tournaments has become a really big thing in Philadelphia. I'm extremely proud of our league. Oh, wow. Wow. You know, I mean, you guys have been operating on the national basis for a while now. So you, you're, you're almost, you're an old hat at this stuff at this particular point. But from what you were telling me, the old hats are what you're going to be coaching. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was the only game in town, some of these guys I'm coaching this weekend were, were running with me on the Philly Knowles and the Road Warriors, which were the original traveling teams from the PTTFL. The Philadelphia Tough Touch Football League, which is now a flag league. Did they change the name? They didn't change it. To no, me. we kept the original name. Kept the original and name. Wow. Yeah. wow. It's iconic. <laughs> well, I forgot, you know, that. You said it right. Last week was called, uh, what, Super Wild Card because wild they had uh, the extra game, right? That is correct. Well, we're going to um, cover what happened last week in our Sterling Net Point Power Ranking Summary. And then we're going to go do the Bias Plus Reports, which details the matchups for this upcoming division playoffs. Uh, we'll finish that up with the Bias Plus Buster of the Week. I think you can guess who that was, Ben. Yes, I can. Yes, if you can. watch the, the uh, Ben and Barry on Football show, you know about the Bias Plus Buster of the Week. And the big surprise last week, we'll talk about a little bit later. And then... Um, Only a surprise to you, if you remember correctly. <laughs> Maybe a surprise to me. <laughs> it was only a surprise to you. Only, yeah. Well, you know, you, yeah, you, you were on that one, right? Yep. Okay. And um, then we're going to do some commentary. And there's a lot happening uh, across the NFL, across the United States, for that matter. Um, and then there's some things that popped up today. They were talking about uh, relative to the NBA and COVID. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And we're... And I don't know how that might bleed over to the NFL, but we shall see. All right. First up, how did we do last week, Benny? Um, especially as the question continues to be asked, how did we do against the spread? So I'll start it out by just talking about the Bias Plus reports. Again, that's how we do the matchups based on the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings. And when I calculated it, out of six games, the bias uh, was right on 66.6%, .6 four out of six. So we got the Bills, the Buccaneers, the Ravens, and the Saints. We were surprised by the Rams. And the biggest surprise of all, the Browns-Steelers game. So how did you do last week? Well, I, in fact, was also four and two for the same 66.67%. However, How do you do that. <laughs> you know, well, I, and you I don't was, go with the same games. <laughs> we don't. We don't. I was surprised by the Rams also, but I got beaten by taking the Titans and I won the Browns game. I picked the Browns. So, although we don't always pick the same, we know, we know. <laughs> wow, that's crazy, that is crazy. Okay, well, um, and how did we do against the spread? Okay, so now the spread, in six games, the spread was actually one and five for a low, what? yes sir, a lowly 16.66%. Now here's how it stacked up. Um, the spread picked the Browns actually with a plus six. 
So when you get a plus number, that means that is not the favorite team, but they're telling you to bet your money on the underdog, okay? So they had the Browns at a plus six. That's the game that they won, okay? They had a Titans. So that, that would have been the Steelers minus six, on the other hand. Uh, yeah, you could have said that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> it would have worked out the same way, okay? Um, they had the Titans at a plus three. That was a loss. Uh, Bills handled that. Saints were minus 10. Uh, that didn't work out. They only lost, they won by eight, I think. Uh, the Washington game turned out to be a push. Unfortunately, we're calling a push a loss because you can't win any money on a push. But uh, they picked Washington with a plus eight. And it turned out that they uh, lost by exactly eight. Um, that's a loss. Seahawks minus three was a loss. And obviously the uh, Bills minus six turned out to be a little closer than even I thought, but that was also a loss. So uh, that's how the spread shaped up. If you bet money on those lines exactly as they were, you would have won only one out of six games. Wow. Wow. That is amazing. That is amazing. All right. Let's go back and see how – the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings has everybody stacked up. We're just doing the teams that are playing here. So bear with me a minute as we pull that up. All right. How visible is that to you? That's pretty good. I like that. You like that? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Sterling Net Point Power Rankings. And because uh, there's – you know, so little games. Uh, we have all of the, the different areas that we look at um, for the teams, and we can kind of cross-reference a few different things here. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and, uh, and take a look at it. But let's start over here. To the left, Team NP stands for net points. As you can see, of the eight teams that are playing, the Baltimore Ravens, uh, have the highest net points. Now, again, these are average net points. The reason we had to do that is because you had a couple teams, Green Bay and Kansas City, who had buys. And so we didn't want to do gross net points because that would not have added up correctly. So we have average net points. And, you know, if you want to know what the gross is, think about the number of games they played and multiply the net points by that, and that's your total net point differential. So if you look at Baltimore, for example, at 10 net points, having played 17 games, that'd be 17 times 10. So you're talking about a gross number of uh, what, 170? 170. 170. So sometimes we, we do gross when everybody's uh, game, uh, number of games is the same. So we have Baltimore at first, followed by the New Orleans Saints. 9.2. Green Bay Packers coming in at 8.8. .8. Tampa Bay at 8.5. Buffalo at 7.6. Kansas City at 6.9. The LA Rams at 5.1. And the Cleveland Browns at an even zero. <laughs> and great. I looked at that and I'm like, wait a minute. Because, you know, I had to make sure all my information was correct. And I looked and they were minus 11 last week. Okay. So they That's moved right. up. Right. They were on the minus ledger. I remember that. Yeah, they were on only team in the playoffs on the minus le uh, ledger. And they won by 11, would put, which put them at net point zero. So of, of the eight teams, they are in last place. Uh, next to that, you have our points four. You can see who the scoring leader is, Green Bay Packers, followed by the Bills, Tampa Bay, New Orleans, Kansas City are both tied at 29.6. Baltimore is coming in at 28.7, Cleveland 26.8, and the Rams are the lowest scoring team of the weekend at 23.6, but they're the number one team on defense. And points against, they are only giving up, well, actually they're tied with the Ravens at 18.6 points per game allowed. The Saints uh, are coming in at 20.4 and third, Tampa Bay. 22.2 Kansas City at 22.6 the Packers 
points per game coming in at six. The Buffalo Bills, 23.5. And Cleveland, again, in last place at 26.8 points per game, uh, points allowed per game. But then when we go to the next column, Cleveland comes in number one and turnover differential at 0.6. Not a big uh, difference between the point differential, especially when you're looking at it on an average basis. Uh, but Baltimore is number one at 0.6. New Orleans and Green Bay are tied two and three at 0.5. The Packers and the Chiefs are tied at fourth and fifth at 0.4. The Baltimore Ravens and Buffalo are tied at point two for sixth and seventh place, and eighth place is being brought up by the Rams, who are the only team with a negative turnover differential number. That's what tied is. If I said tied and didn't say what that means, as I usually do, and then I get reprimanded for it. But that's our favorite person. <laughs> but anyway, Benny. What you got on the rankings here? I'm not going to say anything about Todd. I don't want to encourage you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so when you look at the net point column, the first team you see is Baltimore. The next team you see is New Orleans. Possible Super Bowl matchup? Perhaps. Because Man. overall in net points, those are the two strongest teams at the time. However... Green Bay, being a number one seed in the NFC, are sitting right there at third and poised, so they can't be counted out. But neither can Tampa Bay. Oh, my goodness, it's great. So if I try to figure out what's going to happen, I'll go over to points four first. Green Bay, obviously, having not even played last week, is still sitting at number one in points four. But Buffalo, right behind them. Green Bay Buffalo Super Bowl, you may ask? Quite possible. I love it when we got a lot of possibilities. And the next two teams down, Tampa Bay and New Orleans, hmm, they meet up this week. That's great. You look at points against. The Rams sitting at the top. Best scoring defense of the teams that are left. Oh, excuse me. They're tied with the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah. As expected at the beginning of the season, and it has held true all the way down to the postseason. But the surprising defense of the New Orleans Saints have only given up 20 point, 20 point, four points per game, and there's Tampa Bay sitting at 22.2. Ah, I don't know. Rams, Ravens, perhaps? Mm, no, nah, I don't think so. But we haven't mentioned Cleveland, and Cleveland leads in turnover differential. And it's not a big lead, but it is a lead. And they've been up there. So Cleveland, after last week's win and the fact that they're sitting at the top of turnover differential, I have to give them respect. Now, true, they did ravage Ben Roethlisberger last week. I'm sure that helped. I don't know if I would call it a skew, but, um, whew, man, they put something on them. So I got to give Cleveland their respect. The only thing that, about that, some of those interceptions, the, the Steelers have been struggling in the last quarter or so of this of the season, dropping balls. Yep. And some of those interceptions was were just balls off of people's hands. Now Ben was off too, so some some one at least one or two was just thrown too high or just you know, but uh, wow, it's crazy man, very crazy. Very crazy. All right. So uh, I guess the thing that surprises me, and we always talk about this, is how the Rams are coming in at last in turnover differential, but first on defense. <laughs> you know, and Baltimore is not much better at point two. So, you know, the one thing you can say probably about this weekend, parity. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I would venture to guess, though, that um, a team that turns the ball over a lot, and when I say that, I mean takeaways, um, tends to help their offense more in, in the points for category as opposed to the points against. I mean, that's, that's arguable, but you know what I mean. 
Absolutely, yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, so the Sterling Pro Football Net Point Power Rankings for January 12, 2021. You can find these rankings at the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings Facebook page. I'll be posting all of this information there <clears throat> for your further perusal. How you like that word, Benny? <laughs> All right, so next up, we're going to talk about the actual Bias Plus report. Again, Bias Plus report takes these numbers that we have uh, for the Sterling Net Point Power Rankings. It takes the numbers, the, the uh, net points, and the turnover differential, puts that information together to come up with a Bias Plus score. And the bias will favor the team with the greater of net points and or turnover differential. So that's how that basically works. It's a simple process. We try to keep it that way. But considering that we killed the, uh, that we smashed the, uh, uh, what's that called in gambling again? Right. The spread. <laughs> Not a gambler. What can I tell you? Not a gambler. You know what I mean? Considering that we smashed the spread, not bad. All right. The first game is the LA Rams at the Green Bay Packers. The bias plus score, 4.2, favors the Green Bay Packers. Now, when I took a look at the internals of the net points, uh, Benny, I'm looking at the Rams scoring 23.6 points per game. And the Packers giving up 23.1. Mm-hmm. So right there, uh, offense, defense kind of right pretty much even. Differential here is that the Rams are only giving up about 19 points per game and the Packers are scoring 31. Mm. Consequently, Packers coming out with the bias plus in their favor. Okay, your turn. All right, so uh, let's talk about the Rams since they played last week. First of all, they played the Seattle Seahawks, division rival, big game for them. They actually won the game 30 to 20. I myself was surprised, not only that they won, but also because they won kind of big. The crazy thing was, I didn't know what to expect from the quarterback situation because I thought they were going to go with Wolford. He got knocked out of the game. It looked pretty ugly on the hit, but turns out, even though he had to go to the hospital and all, they turned out that he only had a stinger. So that was a good thing. So in comes Jared Goff with pins in his thumb and all kinds of stuff. He actually was suited up and was considered the emergency quarterback for this particular game. And an emergency arose and he tried it on out there. He was nine of 19 for 155 yards. He threw one touchdown. Um, He came in the game, um, second series of the game. So basically he played the whole game and uh, those numbers don't look great. Um, Cooper Cup had a non-contact injury. Turns out it's bursitis. I think he ruptured a bursa sac, which is like a sack of fluid that you have like around your joints, like your ankles, your knees and your elbows. So when he burst, uh, 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 when that burst, maybe that's where they got the word bursitis from. No, that's not right. Anyway, he's got bursitis. They think he's going to be okay for next week. But he had four catches for 78 yards. He was off to a really great start. Uh, Now, the reason that Jerry Goff didn't have to worry about going to the air too much was because of Cam Akers. Again, rookie running back Cam Akers has taken over the backfield for the L.A. Rams He ran the ball 28 times, 131 yards, and he scored a touchdown. He also ran for 45 yards on two catches. Stellar job, great job by Cam Akers. He's carrying that offense right now because Jared Goff still is not 100%, so they're going to really need him, and he came through for him. Um, Matt Gay, their kicker, also kicked three field goals, a 40, a 39, and a 36. He's been real accurate coming down the stretch. I never talk about kickers, but it's the playoffs now, man. Every point counts. Defensively, they had five sacks on Russell Wilson. Five sacks. I think Aaron Donald had two. I think uh, my man Floyd had two. 
they also had a pick six. So the defense played extremely well. They've earned or they played up to expectations considering that they are first in points against. Um, and I can't say anything about anything more about the LA defense except for watch out. <laughs> They're coming. Okay. Um, now, Aaron Rodgers, although the Packers didn't, you know, play a game last week, I just dug back for some information on these guys because I'm still, you know, I don't make up my mind who I'm going to pick until I go through all the information, give the information to you guys, and then I make a snap decision. It's not always snap, but I make a decision. So Aaron Rodgers, first of all, beat out Mahomes and anybody else you want to mention for first team all pro quarterback. Boom. How about that? That makes him the number one contender for MVP this year. He's thrown for three or more touchdowns 12 times. He played all 17 games. He's done it 12 times, three or more touchdowns. Aaron Jones, number one running back, missed two games this season because of injury and finished fourth in rushing yardage total rushing yardage behind only Derrick Henry, Dalvin Cook, and Jonathan Taylor. And Jonathan Taylor came on late, but, you know, second half of the season, he was great. But they're not playing, so we're not going to talk about him no more. 90-plus yards, four of his last six games. Aaron Jones is a big-time threat. The biggest threat on that team, though, is Devontae Adams, another first-team All-Pro, he scored touchdowns in 10 of his last 11 games. He's got 115 receptions this year, which leads the league and 18 touchdowns, which I believe leads the league also. Uh, I have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure 18 touchdowns uh, for wide receivers, number one this season. I uh, thought that that would be going to um, Diggs with the Bills. So I think Diggs had about 15 touchdowns. Wow. It was close. That's why I said I wasn't hundred percent sure. I, I didn't, I was rushing and I didn't look at Diggs' numbers, but I believe Diggs had 15 total touchdowns through the air. He might've had a couple, you know, he might've ran a reverse or something. I don't know, but Devonte had 18. So um, those are Rogers' two best playmakers. Uh, defensively, boy, I'll tell you, it's hard to brag on the Packers defense. I've seen them play really well. I've seen them play poorly. Uh, their main weakness is against the run. Uh, they are playing the Rams this week, and the Rams do have Cam Akers, who's firing on all cylinders at the moment. Uh, he could be a problem for them. Uh, their best chance is to get out, get a lead, and try to take the run game away and put the pressure on Jared Goff to come back and beat them. If the Rams get off to a good start, Akers has a good day, and Goff isn't hampered by his thumb, Ooh, boy, I don't know. This could be a tough one. But uh, I'm going to go with the bias, and I'm going to pick the Packers. Okay, going with the bias, picking the Packers. Yeah, you know, when I watched the game last night with the Rams, a uh, couple things popped out. And first thing is, if you your backup quarterback is considered your emergency back, your emergency quarterback, and you know he's coming off of an injury, although I realized that, Wolford is pretty good, a pretty good runner. I don't know if I would have had many design runs for him. I think I would have avoided those plays. That's what he got hurt on, on the design run. And it was so early. And I'm like, why? I mean, he's, he's, he was pretty good at getting out of the pocket if he needed to and making something happen. And I was just surprised that, you know, that they did that. It worked out well for him, you know, so that was one. Um, and the other thing was, this was the second week um, where you had a quarterback, you know, come in and play a little hero ball. I mean, before that, it was Lamar coming out of either the bathroom or <laughs> whatever it was he was in. Whatever it was. <laughs> whatever it was. Uh, that's one of those we will never know for sure <laughs> stories. Well, the, the only thing with that is they really did not want Goff to play. That's why they didn't say he was the backup. They said he is the emergency quarterback. Now, obviously, he's a backup. I think they do have somebody else on their roster, but it's the playoffs, man. It's winner go home, you know? 
They, they have Wolford running some design runs because he adds an element to their offense that Goff doesn't give them. And it's the playoffs and it's winner go home. And they're playing the Seattle Seahawks and they're trying to win. It worked for them before. They're going to try to work for it. They try to make it work for them again. So I don't, I understand why they did it. You know, as soon as somebody gets hurt and you say, oh, he shouldn't have, you know, that's like, you know, Eagles fans is like, oh, Wentz runs too much. That's why he got that concussion. Nah, nah. He, he might not run all day and then get forced out of the pocket, try to die for first down. Somebody goes helmet to helmet with you. What are you going to do? That's no, different. That's different. I'm no, talking know about the situation where you know you are weak at backup or non-existent Barry, at backup. Barry, Barry, I know the situation is different, okay? But Goff had his uniform on. Just because they put an emergency tag on him doesn't mean anything. They didn't but make it an act. They didn't want to play him, right? They, they did not want to play him. Mm. They did not want to play him, but they did not make him inactive. He had his uniform on. He had his helmet in his hand. Okay. Difference in philosophy. If you have something for an emergency, you have to have it on hand in case you have an emergency. He was good enough to go in in case of an emergency, and an emergency occurred. What's yeah, and if Goff there? and if Goff had gotten injured, they'd have been up. You know what's creep. Um, and if you I mean, really say that to... every week, bro, come on, let's go, man. You got to be kidding me. Again, every week, the philosophy, every you know, I, I, I understand his ability to run and I don't have a problem with him running if it need be. But I just I'm talking about design runs. That's the only thing I'm talking yeah. about. That means somebody actually called a play for him to run. Bro, yeah. it was the first series of the game. Yeah, no. Why? Game. Why? Let the him, game let, let, plan. Let him, it was the game. Let plan. Makers in the back, hand the ball Barry. off. There's a lot of things Barry. you can do. Barry, it's part of the game plan. Don't yell at me. It's a stupid part of the game plan. That's my whole point. You have a mobile quarterback. Okay, so don't run Lamar Jackson because he might get hurt. Um, if you had no backup. That's the only thing I'm talking about. So, so if, if no RG3 backup. is hurt and McSorley is hurt and the other kid is hurt and all they got is Lamar, you mean to tell me that they wouldn't put no running plays in for him in a playoff winner go home play game? Are you serious? I would suggest that they avoid them. Okay. All right. That's cool. I got you. I would Where we at? Okay. Ravens at Buffalo Bills. Buys plus score. Look at that, Ben. 1.6 favors the Bills. Woo! Crazy. Crazy. That, that, that should be a good game. You got two quarterbacks. Very athletic. Both of them can run. Um... You got – well, let me look at it real quick here. Uh, Ravens are scoring 28.7 points per game. The uh, Bills are allowing 23.5. Ravens are allowing only 19. They were tied with the Rams, but the Bills are scoring 31. <laughs> so, it's kind of the same situation we had with the Green Bay game. Yeah. And I think my pick is going to reflect that. Um, Josh Allen beat Indianapolis last week, 27, 24, uh, score sounds close. If you watch the game, you realize that it really wasn't that close. Probably was just that close because they had a little slow start, but he was 26 to 35 for a whopping 324 yards. He threw two touchdown passes. He also ran the ball 11 times. As far as I know, their backup was pretty good. He was well, he didn't have any injuries. So they ran the ball 11 times for 54 yards and another touchdown, okay? Picked the Colts secondary apart in the second half, especially. They had no answer for him. Stephon Diggs, also off to a little slow start. I don't think they targeted him uh, too much in the first half, but in the second half, he went crazy. Six out of nine catch, uh, he caught six balls out of nine throws, 128 yards, he scored a touchdown. Gabriel Davis, we haven't talked about Gabriel Davis all year, but I've been watching him because I like the Bills. Gabriel Davis is a good, deep threat, and he makes a lot of splash plays. When, when they think they got Stephon Diggs covered up, 
here comes Gabriel Davis. He's the number three receiver. He had four targets, caught all four balls, big 85 yards. Okay. Cole Beasley, Mr. Dependable, playing through a knee injury. Okay. Um, I wasn't even sure he was going to play, but he did play. Some plays he got up off the ground and he was limping. But guess what? Threw him seven balls. He caught all seven of them for 57 wow. yards. Got wow. moved to six. Devastating one, two, three punch. Very diverse um, receiver core. Uh, they're up there with the best. And I really love them. Now, defensively, Buffalo's had some challenges. Uh, they didn't have a great game this time, but they were pretty solid. Um, they held Jonathan Taylor pretty much in check. He did get 78 yards on the ground on 21 carries, which is pretty good. It's not great, but it's pretty good for 21 carries. But that comes out to 3.7 yards per carry. So they did the job uh, on the ground. Um, but they weren't able to sack Phillip Rivers. <laughs> well, you know what? Rivers really doesn't get sacked a lot. He, he can't move, so he knows he has to get rid of the ball. So he does that. Uh, and they weren't able to come up with any interceptions either. Let's talk about another kicker, a very good kicker, very reliable kicker, Tyler Bass. Two for two on field goals, and his longest was a 54-yarder. That makes him a huge offensive threat also. Buffalo's looking good. Now, the Ravens defeated the Tennessee Titans 20-13. to This game did not turn out the way I thought it would and was not even as good as I thought it was going to be, let alone the fact that I picked the Titans to win the game. Uh, Lamar was electric. First of all, let me get his passing numbers out the way because, you know, they're nothing to write home about, but they never are during the week. Uh, 17 to 24, 179 yards. Didn't throw any touchdowns this, this week. Now, the week before, he had less than 200 yards passing, but he threw for two touchdowns. This time, he didn't throw for any. And he did get picked off once uh, early in the game. He did, however, run the ball 16 times for a gigantic 136 yards. And he broke off a 48-yarder that he ran in for a touchdown. Um, once he gets going, I mean, the Titans' defense was not really great. They've had all kind of issues against the run. But when you got a guy like this guy, once he gets past the, past the first level, these DBs are, their heads are spinning. He gave them all kind of fits. So great day for Lamar on the ground. Can I Jake, say just this about the Lamar run? Yes. I watched him run by people who were further down the field than he was. <laughs> and yes. he still couldn't get yes. it. You can't, you can't get a bead on him. You know what I mean? Like if a big running back breaks through and he breaks a couple tackles and he's chugging along, you know, Chances are he might throw you one fake or he's going to stiff arm you, but you can at least get a beat on him. Can't get a beat on Lamar. You can't line him up for a big hit unless he doesn't see you. You got to get him from the side. You can't get him. For, if he sees you, unless you pin him to the sideline, you're not going to get him. And that's, that's the kind of weapon that he is. Um, J.K. Dobbins, another rookie running back that's kind of taken over the backfield for his team. Uh, he was okay. He had nine carries for 43 yards. He did run in a touchdown. And, oh, let me talk about Marquise Brown. Now, they threw Marquise Brown the ball nine times. He caught seven of them for 109 yards. That might be close to his best game of the season. Yeah. This is another guy who has a whole lot of speed but has issues getting open. And then when he does get open, he's had some problems with dropping the ball. Okay, but in this game, he came through. Uh, 109 yards is really big. Mark Andrews is Mr. Reliable. He did have a couple of drops too, um, but he's big, athletic. He's like a little, little lower grade uh, from all the tight ends like Kelsey and Waller, but he's, he's right there, maybe top four, top five. So you got to watch him at all times. Um, defensively, they only had one sack. They did have an interception, but it was a big interception by Marcus Peters that sealed the game. And Justin Tucker, big leg Justin Tucker, he missed a field goal from 52 yards out, but he made one from 51 yards out. So again, huge threat in the kicking department. 
Uh, it's no wonder that these teams are where they are when, when you got playmakers all the way down to the doggone kicker, okay? So, you know, when you're in a game, it's a field position battle, and you got a really great kicker, that gives you a little bit of an advantage, even if field position is against you. Uh, all that being said, man, I want to take the Ravens really, really bad, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to take my team, my favorite team. And when I say my team, everybody knows my team is the Giants. But my favorite AFC team has been the Bills all year long. I said it from the first video of the season, and I'm saying it now. The Bills will beat the Ravens. The Bills' defense is is questionable, and that that ability of Lamar to run is such a wild card. But uh, this looks to be a great game. 1.6 is the bias plus favoring the Bills. But guess what? It's not the smallest of the weekend. So that means there's some tight things coming up very shortly. Okay, what's up next here? All right, the surprise team, the Cleveland Browns, are going into Kansas City to play the well-rested the well-rested um, Kansas City Chiefs with the, with the coach who does probably better than any coach in history coming off of an a, a extra week uh, off, a bye week. Um, Andy Reid is known for <laughs> winning those. Bye week Andy. <laughs> bye you week know, Andy. Bye week Andy, man. You got to give it to him. So the bias plus score six point seven again times what sixteen to seventeen games that would be a big number favors the Kansas City Chiefs, our Cleveland our Cleveland Browns the Cleveland Browns came in at net point zero, so they definitely were not going to be ahead of the Kansas City Chiefs, but that's better than what they were last week where they were minus eleven and they still won the game, but the bias says it's about the Chiefs this week. Who you got? Well, sir, Browns went into Pittsburgh, laid the smack down on them, okay? Again, this is another game where the final score doesn't really tell you how bad a beatdown the Pittsburgh Steelers took. Baker Mayfield was 21-34, 263 yards. He scored three touchdowns. So there wasn't a whole lot of bombs, but he was very accurate. He was extremely mobile. He really did a great job, a job that a year or two ago, no one would believe he would ever be able to do in this league. So kudos to Baker Mayfield. Um, this is the Browns' first postseason win since 1995. It is their first postseason road win in 52 years. Holy mackerel. Well, people in Cleveland are extremely excited. Now, oh, and the halftime lead was 35 to 10. So when I'm telling you, you know, uh, it was a beat down. It was a beat down. Uh, Pittsburgh made it interesting in the second half, but when you're coming from behind like that, that's it, just, it's crazy. Um, now, when you talk about the Cleveland Browns, you have to talk about the run game. Two number one backs. They don't have a number one and a number two. They got two number one backs. Nick Chubb, 18 carries, 76 yards. He didn't find the end zone but he had some bruising runs where he did his real damage was crazy as this might sound is he had four catches and ripped off 69 yards on those four catches and mm. did four on one of them. I wow. think it was like a 40 yarder real nice run. Nick Chubb is no joke. And, and the, the tackling was atrocious. I mean, they were, they just were running through some of those Steelers, man. Steelers defense looked horrible. But it was it was a sign of things to come at least four weeks ago, minimum. You could see that they were starting to weaken, that teams were starting to 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 really bang on them. And uh it's just I mean, I saw it coming. So, you know, I picked the Browns to win, I saw it coming, and it turned out that way. Uh Steelers defense did not end up the season the way they started it. Um the other running back, Kareem Hunt, he only had eight carries, but he got 48 yards, and they were 48 of the baddest runs you ever <laughs> going to see, okay? He scored two touchdowns, right? He averaged 
10 touches per game in the last five games. That's not much, is it? But guess what that tells me? Remember who he used to play for? Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah. Who did they play this week? Kansas City Chiefs. Who got some fresh ass legs? Kareem Hunt. That's, <laughs> I'll just leave that dangling out there. I'm gonna leave that dangling out there. Jarvis Landry, big time Jarvis Landry. Five catches off eight targets, whopping 92 yards. He had a real good run after catch too for his touchdown. And the defense had four interceptions. Now, again, I didn't want to say it was a skew when the Browns came up number one in turnover differential of all the teams that are still left playing. Came so, up what? I said I didn't want to say it was a skew. Okay. You they, said they, had, they, they had four interceptions last week against Big Ben. Okay. Oh, and, and turnover differential. Right. Yeah. So, so, so I just want to qualify it, okay? Roethlisberger did throw four touchdown passes. But he threw 68 total passes. Oh, my goodness. But this is what I was saying, because I even said the Steelers, they don't even look like they're going to run if they're at the one-yard line anymore. I picked the Browns last week. I told you their run game is down. Connor does not have it this year. He doesn't have it. He's not 100%. And Benny Snell is, is, is just not good enough. It's just not good enough. I can't believe Connor's 100%. He can't be because I've seen him run so much better, okay? But that being said, their run game is down. It's been down for the last few weeks, and I saw this coming. I saw this coming. Plus, besides, you can't run the ball when you're down 35 to 10 in the first half. I mean, you might, you might start the third quarter with a couple of runs, but if you get three yards, five yards, two yards, seven yards, three yards – you got to get away from that because the clock is running. You know what I mean? Well, the, the only good thing was that they gave up all of those points so early. And so I thought that they still could actually run because it was three quarters left in the game. You Bro, know, they but didn't you got to play defense. The second quarter. If they had done more in the second quarter, they had a good chance. But they didn't do anything in the second quarter. They put up 10 points in the first half. The Browns had 30 plus in the first quarter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so the Browns slowed down in the second quarter and it, and the Steelers didn't do anything. They got a touchdown and a field goal. That's not good enough. Not good enough. Not when you fall behind like that. Um, so now they're going to play the chiefs. The Browns are going to go to Kansas city. Wow. This one looks, this one looks easy, but listen carefully. Patrick Mahomes has thrown 40 passes or more seven out of his last eight games. Mm. 40 passes or more in seven of his last eight games. He's thrown for 300 plus yards in six of his last eight games and thrown for 400 plus yards twice in those last eight games. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Why, you say? Because Clyde Edwards Hilaire has four touchdowns on the ground this season. He broke 100 yards twice. He missed weeks 13, 16, and he might have been able to play week 17, but they chose not to play him because of injury. Sounds like the same situation we had last week when I talked about the Steelers. Their run game is down, and Le'Veon Bell hasn't been any help at all. Not in my estimation. He hasn't been any help at all. Now, Tyreek Hill rested his sore hammy, so he should be 100%, but he did have a hammy. Sometimes hammies can linger. The big play guy on this team, for real, for real, is Travis Kelsey. Okay, also a first team all pro. Double digit targets in seven of his last eight games. Double digit targets. He's caught eight or more balls in seven out of the last eight games. There's a couple games where he had 10 catches, nine, 10 catches. So again, you know, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs are not who we necessarily thought they were, as far as I'm concerned. 
And all that being said, uh, I have to go with the Cleveland Browns. Yes, I am going against the bias. I'm going to pick the Cleveland Browns. Let me give you another reason. I'll give you another reason. The other reason is, what really has the Kansas City defense done lately? Really. Even a lot of the games that they won were very high-scoring games. They have a tendency to give up points. They're shaky against the run. They've been burnt by the pass. They're just not, they're not a top flight defense. They're really not. Their defense thrives off of Patrick Mahomes making, some, making things happen offensively. Big plays, splash plays, grabbing the momentum. You know what I mean? That's what their defense feeds off of. But when it comes down to a slugfest or a scoring match, it's all on Mahomes' shoulders. The defense does not hold up their end of the deal. So there again, if you don't believe me yet, believe me now, Cleveland Browns go to Kansas City and beat the Chiefs. Off the reservation once again, are you, eh? Yes. <laughs> and you're yeah. laughing again. You laugh I'm last laughing again. Yes, I am laughing again. <laughs> but now let me say this. Quarterback play. Patrick Mahomes versus Big Ben Roethlisberger. Ben's off completely. Now, I don't think that Cleveland's going to get the help from the quarterback that they got from Ben when it comes to Patrick Mahomes, first and foremost. And, and, and I guess maybe that's also because they have Travis Kelsey, who is – there's nobody that the Steelers have like that. That can that can make that level of an impact, and they also have a ton of speed. So I don't know, you know, if the Browns are going to be able to handle that speed. They have but, a ton of speed where? Huh? Where they have a ton of speed at? Wide right receiver. Name three. Oh. <laughs> Stop. You know they yeah. got fast people. They're exactly. known for having fast. Who's their number one receiver? Tyreek Hill. Is he like the fastest guy in the league or not? Maybe behind Mostert, maybe. There might be a couple of guys that are up there with him. Maybe. Right. So, so maybe they don't have a ton of really fast guys, but they have at least one really fast guy. No, they, they do have fast guys. McCall Hartman is real fast. If, okay. he catches, if he catches more than three passes, I'll be shocked. Sammy Watkins, if he doesn't trip getting out of the shower, might get <laughs> – <laughs> Might get five targets and catch two of them. <laughs> I'm not worried about those dudes, man. The problem for Kansas City is going to be stopping the run and running the ball themselves. If they can't stop the run and Baker can put a couple touchdowns on the board through the air or with Chubb or with Hunt, who is already going on the record as saying that this game is personal to him, okay, and it's all up to Patrick Mahomes to bring them back. It's going to be a problem. It's well, it's a small a bias, no doubt that this is this is an issue. Right. You know, um, as far as I'm concerned, Kareem Hunt is the closest thing to Alvin Kamara <laughs> out okay. there. Those two guys, you know, that skill set is so similar and so scary. You know that you really have to give them a lot of credit. Um, how are we injury wise relative to because you know you got the COVID scenario that affected the Browns at one point, and the the, the uh, Chiefs seem to be healthy. I haven't heard anything. Uh, as far as I know, the Chiefs are healthy um, unless they've had some long term injury with somebody that may be still out. But I can't I can't really think of anybody. Sammy Watkins has hurt all the dog on time, but he hasn't played in weeks, so he should be okay. And like I said, Tyreek Hill's got a little hammy, but he should be okay. He's actually played through it uh, a couple of times, so he should be all right. Um, now the and Browns, a couple weeks off, right? Yes. Now the Browns actually were missing um, two starting offensive linemen. And, oh, did you hear the funny story? They no. brought in a lineman from I, – I don't even know if this guy was on their practice squad. I think they got him off the street. I'm not 100% sure where they got him from. Baker met him in the locker room while they're getting dressed for the game. 
<laughs> did hear that. The guy that was the backup for the starter that was hurt got hurt, and this dude went in the game. And they still ran the ball, ran the ball. at will. <laughs> Let's go. All right. You going with the Browns. I'm not going to laugh at you. I'm just going to snicker like. Nah, you already did. It's too late. It's too late. You already did. Tampa Bay Buccaneers going in to visit the New Orleans Saints. Benny, point seven is the bias plus score favoring the Saints. And it is the smallest bias plus score of the weekend. Wow. So you look at a point seven and you figure, wow, this is this is the closest game of the weekend. These these teams are very well matched up, uh, almost equal. So I don't know. I don't know about that. Let's take a look. Uh, Bucks go into Washington and beat the Washington football team 31 to 23. Tom Brady, 22 of 40, not his best day, but he did throw for 381, uh, 381 yards and did throw for two touchdowns. Um, that's 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 pretty uh, pretty classic Tom Brady day. You know, he might have missed short a couple of times, but when he needed to go big, he was able to go big. Um, Ronald Jones, who's worked his way up to being the number one running back on the team, didn't play last week. He, in fact, had missed the week before with a quad injury, came back, practiced on Thursday and Friday, and seemed to be fine. And then when he tried to stretch to get ready for the game, they said he couldn't like he couldn't open up and, and really run like he normally does. So that's why he didn't play. Rumor has it, and I've heard this before, rumor has it that the plane ride may have had something to do with it. Yeah, the cabin pressure does something to you, it tightens you up. What? Yeah, yeah. So if you don't have any injuries, there's nothing wrong with you. You would never notice, you know. But for something like that, yeah, that's that's what they're saying happened. So, but he should be okay for this game. Now, um, Mike Evans, who had the hyperextended knee from the week before, came back, played on it, had 10 targets, caught six balls, 119 yards. He looks fine. He looks fine. He looks 100%. Chris Godwin had a lot of drops in this game. That's not like Chris Godwin. I don't know what the heck was going on. He was targeted 12 times. So he was obviously running good routes and getting open to get 12 passes thrown to him, but he only caught five of them. That's out of character for him. Uh, I expect him to do a whole heck of a lot better in this game coming up. Antonio Brown only got three targets, but he caught two balls. One of them was a 36-yard touchdown pass. So, you know, we were talking about taking the top off and all that other stuff last week. He is a I, – I, I'm not going to use take the top off receiver for him anymore. He is a deep threat. Yeah, he can run the whole route tree. Yes, he can. But when they really need to go downfield, A.B. is the man. They got him, and he's just sitting in the cut waiting for, for the big play to happen, and, and it's been happening. Uh, defensively? They had two sacks and one interception against Taylor Heineke, who played extremely well, to tell you the truth. It's just that, you know, Washington was just outmanned. Uh, and again, a really good kicker, Ryan Suckup. He didn't kick any real long balls, but he did convert on all four of his field goals. So three, six, nine, twelve. That's 12 points. That's two touchdowns from your kicker. Okay? Big time. Ah. Drew Brees. Well, they played the Bears. Obviously, they won. The game was 21. The score was 21 to 9. Doesn't sound like they had much trouble at all. And in fact, they didn't. So Brees, this is only his fourth game coming back from all those broken ribs and a punctured lung and all that stuff. It's only his fourth. This was only his fourth game back. This weekend will be his fifth. Okay. He was 28 to 39, 265 yards, two touchdown passes. Uh, no interceptions. Uh, hmm. Wow. Yeah. Since he's been back, he's thrown 44 completions for 382 yards and six touchdowns. That's just since he's been back. Not bad, right? 
I bet. Right. Uh, oh, wait. I'm sorry. That's incorrect. That would be bad. He's thrown 44 completions, 382 yards, and six touchdowns in the two games against Tampa Bay. <laughs> Alvin Kamara, 23 carries, 99 yards, and a touchdown. Another great day for Alvin Kamara. 115 yards and three touchdowns, won 31 touches over his last two games. Uh, Mike Thomas is back. Seven targets, five catches, 73 and a touchdown. This, this guy runs the slant better than anybody. And defensively, they only had one sack, but they shut down David Montgomery and they hassled and harassed Trubisky all day long. Basically just rendered him ineffective. This game was a walk. It was no big deal at all. I'm going to go. I'm going to go with the bias. I'm going to go with the bias because I believe that the Saints defense is better than the Buccaneers defense. I believe the Saints defense, although it has some holes, has less holes than the Buccaneers defense. Uh, I'm going to go with the Saints defense because although Leonard Fournette played well last week, if Ronald Jones isn't 100 percent, that could be a problem for the Buccaneers run game. And everything goes on Brady then. And yeah, sure, he's got the great receiving core. And yeah, he's playing really well right now. But um, it's time. The, the window, the Drew Brees window is almost closed. And I love Drew Brees. I'm taking the Saints in this one. I'm going to go with the bias. I'm taking the Saints. So close. And, and you know, when you look at... The Saints giving up 20.4 points per game. Buccaneers giving up 22. So when you say they're a little better, yes, they are. Not much. Point-wise, not much, not much. Not much. Um, and they're just giving up, uh, what, 20, they're scoring 29.6. Bucks are scoring 30.8. So, man, this, this, this is going to be a nice game to close out division weekends. I mean, it's, it's going to be a challenge. This this is the one that if I'm going to say I'm not sure about one, this is the one I'm not sure about. I'm going to take the Saints confidently, but I'll tell you, the Buccaneers offense is so explosive that things are going to have to really go right offensively for the Saints to make sure that the game doesn't get away from them. I, I don't expect this game to be high scoring. I expect it to be in the 20s somewhere um, remember the first time they played you know this week or this season when they played earlier this season rather i don't remember the game specifically i remember the saints won and but I, I remember about that game handled. huh handled. yeah and, and what i remember about that game was that it seemed as if the bucks defense was not ready for the efficient passing game of drew Brees. And that was the to me made the biggest difference. I mean, you know. I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that, along with the fact that Arians and Brady weren't on the same page. Obviously, first game of the season. Yeah, yeah, early on. So you know, we'll see this. I mean, because the Saints, you know, they've been doing this for a while now, and for uh, the Bucks, this is their year, first year together. So we'll see how that goes through. But you're going with the bias, which is just point seven, less than one point per game totaling less than 17 points across 17 games. That is amazing. All right, Benny, that wraps up the Bias Plus. And what we like to do at the end of the Bias Plus is to talk about the previous week and the team that was the Bias Plus Buster of the Week. Congratulations to the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> Man, they did the damn thing, man. Cleveland Browns, I'm telling you, that game was amazing. When they got off to the fast start, I was like, yes, yes, they're going to win. This is how they have to do it. And after the first quarter, I was like, okay, even I don't believe this. <laughs> it was just, it was, well, I'll tell you what, the bad snap <laughs> that rolled into the end zone, 
That that's the worst way you can start a game. Now the and you know what popped into my head, but they ended up winning the game. Um, that happened to Peyton Manning when he was with the Broncos. Oh really? Yes. Yeah. I, can't I remember that. I remember. Did they? Yeah, they uh, Broncos beat the Panthers with Cam Newton, I believe. I might have games mixed up. I don't know. I, I'm getting old. I'm getting old. But I remember <laughs> him having a really bad snap uh, early in a, in a Super Bowl. In fact, um, yeah, I remember that. That was pretty crazy. But yeah, yeah, Cleveland Browns gotta love them. So we were talking about the bias, and last week we were doing uh, the gross numbers, not the average number. That's why you're seeing a bias plus score of 119. Uh, If you were to divide that by uh, 16 games, you know, you'd have that average, and it would be much less. But nevertheless, they won by 11, which gives them a bias plus buster score of 130. So congratulations again to the Cleveland Browns who Ben took this week. Man, the Browns over the Chiefs. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for Chiefs fans. It's going to be devastating to their fan base. Uh, It's going to be tough on Andy Reid. But, I mean, come on, man. Who? Who? (laughs) When's the last time somebody went back to back Super Bowls? In fact, when's the last time somebody 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 went back to back just getting to the Super Bowl? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, you know, I always remind people because you know my beloved Niners have five Super Bowls. The Steelers have six. The Patriots have six. But we're at, like, what is the Super Bowl coming up? What, 50 what, you know? I think it's 52. So out of 52, if you have six, you lead the league. That just shows you how hard it is to win a Super Bowl. Absolutely. And the Patriots, didn't the Patriots lose three Super Bowls? Oh, yeah, they've had their share of losses. That's That's for sure. They've been there nine times. That's That's for sure. You know, I did a, a Sterling Net Point ranking on Super Bowl games, all of the Super Bowl games, and who netted out best for net points winning in the Super Bowl. And it's my Niners, believe it or not. You think about the uh, the games that they played, the Super Bowls they played, they had blowouts. And not many right. Super Bowls wound up in blowouts. You know, a lot of them are field goals and things like that. So Niners uh, are in first place relative to net points in Super Bowls. All right. Well, that wraps up the Bias Plus and the Bias Plus Buster portion of the show. Next up, we're going to finish up with commentary. Ben, so much happening in commentary this week. It is ridiculous. Um, We're going to kind of I'm assuming, I don't know, unless you have a commentary relative to what happened in the Capitol, I'm not really going to deal with that right now um, because it's just, huh? I got something. Yeah, okay. I'll let you handle that. And, and, you know, we watch CNN over here and every once in a while I look at MSNBC and I even look at Fox from time to time just to kind of see what's going on and and compare how people are looking at things. And this may have been on one of the stations, it may not have. I happen to hear it on the radio. I uh, think I was listening to the Steve Harvey show in the morning. In the videos of the people that got inside of the Capitol building, there was a video of a black, either police officer, security guard, whatever he was, I couldn't make out the uniform. And it would look like they were chasing him up the steps. You remember seeing that video? Yeah, yeah, he's a hero. Go ahead and tell the story. Yes, yes, yes. He was like, kind of acting like, no, get back, get back. And then he run up the steps a little bit and then they chase him and then he, oh, stop, stop. And then what he was in fact doing was leading them in a direction away from the people they were looking for, which was our state representatives and senators and taking them in a direction where he felt he could get some backup, which in fact did come. And, And this is the other thing, when they talk about uh, this thing was kind of an inside job. From what I've heard from several sources, 
inside that building, it's like a maze. Like if you've never been there, maybe even if you did go there once or twice on a tour, it's very difficult to actually find specific places inside that building. So those people thought they were being radical, like, oh, we're going to run him and he's going to run. The, you know what I mean? And here he's taking them right where he wanted them to go and away from where they thought they were going. And on top of that, the fact that some people did find their way into certain senators' offices and find their way to the floor of the Senate tells me that, yes, indeed, that was an inside job. But that's all I got to say about that. Yeah, I'm just going to say it was a mess. And um, hopefully the inauguration will be less of a mess, although the FBI is looking for armed protests at all the capitals. So yeah, we shall yeah. see. We shall see. I hope it doesn't affect the games. I hope it doesn't turn into anything really crazy. But let's look at the Ben and Barry on football Facebook page and talk about something that's a little more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I got slimed. <laughs> Benny, did you watch any of you? You did because you we talked about it. I know you did. I, I, I watched a little bit of it. I watched bits and pieces. Um, I thought they covered the game pretty well. I thought yeah. Nick Burleson would have a lot more to say, and he didn't. The, the young people pretty much handled most of the game commentary, the color and the play by play. So I thought that was great. Um, they were rattling off names of, of stuff that comes on Nickelodeon and people and this and that. And I, you know, I don't, I don't remember that. My kids are grown now, but they did watch Nickelodeon. Um, and they had the little uh, effects and stuff going on when they scored touchdowns. I thought it was pretty cool. Okay. It was fun. It actually, they actually replayed that today. Okay. So while I was their, working their on, version? huh? Their version of the game? The Nickelodeon version. Yeah, okay. I appreciate that. Um, and I, I watched a little bit of it again. I, I enjoyed it because, well, number one, uh, I thought Nick Burleson did a great job. They kind of assumed that they had a young audience who maybe weren't, you know, uh, aficionados of football. Weren't, you know, so he explained all the bit fundamentals, the red zone and all of that kind of stuff, you know, and the slime in the end zone when somebody scored the slime showers or the eruption of slime and all of that. Great. Uh, and, and, you know, it's funny because you think about it, these guys are out there playing. They have no idea. What yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, you know. I bro, bet you their kids, their kids told them about it, though. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I thought it was fun. I enjoyed it. Um, and they are talking about doing it again. So... Uh, kudos uh, to the NFL channel. All right, let's talk about something a little more controversial. Eagles fired Doug Peterson. You are in the NFC East, East, East uh, with your beloved Giants. It doesn't matter. You can call it what you want. <laughs> and the Eagles have fired Doug Peterson. Where do you stand on that? Where do I stand? Do you have any opinion, have any opinion on that? Well, uh, everybody else does, so, you know. I mean, let's face it. We, we've been watching NFL football for a long time, okay? I've seen, I've seen head coaches get fired for less, all right? I, I listen to talk radio. Obviously, we live in Philadelphia, so I'm listening to the Philadelphia station, and people are coming on, and they're trying to defend this guy, and they're using the fact that he won a Super Bowl. How many years ago now has it been? Three. Okay, as, as a point, uh, I mean, how much grace do you get? Let's face it, from that high point to where they are now, they've done nothing but go down, okay? It's, it's, been, a, it's been a complete and steady uh, digression since they won the Super Bowl, which in my opinion, and people can hate me for this if they want to because I'm a Giants fan, but they caught lightning in a bottle, bro. Uh, and it's happened before. They're not the only ones. I'm not saying they shouldn't have won. They earned it, okay? But let's face it. They've done nothing since but get worse. They've had bad draft picks. 
they've chosen uh, players when radio personalities, TV personalities, and your everyday fans on the street all agree on other players. But for whatever reason, Howie Roseman has decided to take somebody else and have everybody scratching their heads. And it just doesn't seem to be working out. It could work out in the future. But there were people that they passed over that showed up and balled out right away. This was a great rookie wide receiver class. And it actually was a really good rookie running back class. If you want to look at Robinson with the Jags, Gaskin with the uh, with Miami, uh, Jonathan Taylor. They, these guys are all J.K. Dobbins. These guys are all over the place. So in my opinion, Howie Roseman should have been fired also. But I understand that him and the owner are good friends. So he's going to get the benefit of the doubt. The bottom line is Doug Peterson, in my estimation, is not a good game day coach. He really isn't. He's just not. And he didn't do anything that I think he could have done to help Carson Wentz to the point where I've heard people saying he set them up, <laughs> that he set, set Wentz up to get sat down. No rollouts. Very little play action. Of course, you can't run an effective play action unless you run the ball. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Miles, no. Miles Sanders' numbers are down for no reason. It's crazy. It's crazy. I'm no football expert. I would never be a head coach in the NFL. But doggone it, he is one. And they're paying him. And he's not getting the job done. He had to go. He had to go. You and I have questioned uh, the Eagles um, all season. <laughs> you know, we, we were looking at what was going on. We questioned their run choices or their, their choices between run and pass. And I and I, I mentioned, for example, the one series I watched where, you know, Corey Clement was in the game. First down, they give it to him. He goes for seven yards. Second down, they're in an empty backfield. Third down, they're in an empty backfield. They go for fourth going because he likes to go for it on four again in an empty backfield this time he gets he fumbles the ball you know and and it's it was a mess and it's like dude it's second and three you know but we question their uh what happened to their offense when frank reich left and that was a hole that i don't think they were ever able to fill between him, Frank Wright leaving, and Howie Roseman making some of the choices that he made. And like you said, he gets a pass here, you know, where, where Peterson didn't. You know, that's that's going to be problematic down the road because, I mean, the bottom line is, you know, if I don't care who you bring in here. If you're not, if you're not going to give the coach good say in his offensive coordinators, and if you're not going to give him good say in the choices of people, then it's going to be problematic, you know? And I, so, you know, it is what it is. I just wanted to have a chance to take a look at it and, and give you a chance to, to see what you wanted to do to weigh in on that. All right. Next up in our commentary, we have Bill Belichick who was going to receive Trump's Medal of Honor or Medal of Freedom, normally a great honor, but decided against accepting it, um, which I am so glad to hear that he did. Wow. So, congrats. So is, Massachusetts rep asks Bill Belichick to do the right thing. So... A state rep contacted him after he was nominated for this, I guess. And after talking to him, he decided not to accept it. No. Uh, <laughs> and you know, they he's been to the White House a few times. He's yeah. had a state, he has this a relationship picture, with Trump. This picture, this picture is from one of their Super Bowl wins one when they Super Bowls, yeah. 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 
And and the owner was a you know they were all contributors to to that to his campaign. Yes. You know? So much of that now is starting to dry up, and it's just he's becoming more radical. But long story short, Bill Belichick, congratulations! Glad you did not make that choice. It will be interesting if um, the incoming president gave him gave Bill Belichick the Medal of Freedom. <laughs> <laughs> get it from Biden instead. What, I, what right. I'm looking for is for him to see if he can find time in his schedule, because I know he's going to be busy, to bring in all the championship teams that refuse to go to the Trump White House. Oh, man. Celebrate. Yeah, bring them in. Because I've already heard a couple of them say, I'd be happy if he invites us. We'll, we'll be sure enough we'll be there. That, so, that's a great idea, though, Benny. I mean, can you right. imagine what that stage would look like? <laughs> Golden State got uninvited. Right, right. The, yeah, Eagles, basketball. the Eagles got uninvited. Right. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. <laughs> that's an idea. That's an idea. I'm going to put that up on the, on the page. Yeah. The women's soccer team got uninvited. Yeah, the, the Lakers. He, he didn't even invite the Lakers. He's like, oh, I got that LeBron guy. That's okay. <laughs> He's a radical. I'm telling you, that is so so true. So so true. And you know, there's still issues. One of the college basketball teams took a knee, you know, and, and then wound up getting harassed by a sheriff who started burning their jerseys. There's just so much still to be done. But okay, let's jump on to this next story here. I know you watched the national championship. Yeah, I watched like three quarters of it. <laughs> Bama's, Bama's strong, bro. Bama's strong. Ohio State's a good team. But uh, yeah, that's I, I tell you what, I know a lot of people probably bet on Ohio State based on the fact that they beat Clemson because everybody was looking forward to Bama playing Clemson. I think that would have been a better game, and I think Clemson had a better chance to beat them, but that game got away from them the week before. Um, Justin Fields had had the – is his name Justin Fields or Josh Fields? I think you were right the first time. But go ahead. Fields – he had the game of his life. That had to be the game of his college career to play that well against that good of a team. Wasn't uh, he injured also? Wasn't he playing a little hurt? Uh, yeah, I think it, late in the game he got banged up a little bit, but yeah. Still, though, this, this is the crazy thing about college. Even, even big-time college teams, they're loaded with great athletes, but... A lot of these guys have a lot to learn about technique and and they don't always go up against top notch competition week after week after week. So uh, the defenses have have a tendency to be weak. And what I mean by weak is they just they just have holes. They don't play as a solid unit like a professional team would do. And that's that's kind of the difference between college and the pros. Um, that's why you get these high scoring games, you know what I mean? But um, Devontae Smith, Heisman Trophy winner, who I was shocked because they never give the Heisman to a receiver. Oh my goodness, that, that was amazing. And then he comes out in, 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 the, in the championship game and shows off. And of course, I go on Facebook today and people are going, oh, Devontae Smith, yeah, he's okay. You know, we'll see if he can do that in the NFL. I'm like, did you not just see Jerry Judy, Justin Jefferson, C.D. Lamb? What what what's wrong with y'all? What's what's wrong with y'all? If you watched them in college, and then saw them transition to the NFL, and then you watched that game last night, what makes you think that they're talking about this guy like, oh, he ain't gonna be that good? But you know how people are. They're, yeah. gonna, they're gonna have doubts. Me, I go back, I look at the tape. Number one thing I notice, I don't know how good of a route runner he is because most of his routes were pretty simple because he could just pretty much do what he wanted. You know what I mean? 
He's he's not super fast. I think his best time in the 40s is a 4-4, but he's usually in the low 4-5s, high 4-4s, or high 4s. Um, but he's what I did notice is his, his size hand, is pretty. Huh? He's not that big either. Well, he's 6'1", but he only weighs like 178 pounds. I have an issue with that because I went back and I looked – at all the top receivers that just got picked in this last draft. And the lightest guy is probably KJ Hamler from Penn State. And he's only 5'9, and he weighs like 175 pounds. Smith only weighs 178 pounds, and he's 6'1. So yeah, the kid is skinny. Okay. CD Lamb, Judy, all those guys, they're all in the 180, 190, 200, 200 plus. And they're all 6'1 or taller. Okay, so, but you could put weight on him. That's no big deal. A nice eating regimen and a weight regimen, no problem. They can get him up in the 180s. That's, that's no big deal. He might be 190 by the time he gets in. Um, again, so uh, his weight, his speed, and his route running ability, and I'm not saying he runs poor routes. I'm saying I don't know how good a route runner he could be because he didn't really show off his route running skills during his college career. But what I did see was he has excellent hands. Yeah. He's excellent catching 50-50 balls. Okay. And he worked hard to get two feet in bounds on sideline passes and passes in the back of the end zone when he didn't have to. You only I got saw that. One that. Foot in. I saw have, that. Yes, you only have to have one foot in in college. But yeah. he's like, look at this, scouts. Uh-uh. Toe drag swag, baby. I'm ready. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that I did notice. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think he won't have any problems. All right. All right. Well, last but not least for commentary, as far as our page is concerned, just wanted to show a little bit of love for Chase Young as he came in as the defensive rookie of the year. Had a great year. It ended a little early for him, but he's, he seems like a really good kid, and he's going to be a monster for a few years to come. Bro, nobody, nobody expected the Washington football team to win the NFC East and get to the playoffs. Nobody. I, I, don't, I don't care, D.C. fan. I don't care if you bleed – Maroon and gold, you didn't think they were going to do that. And it helped that everybody else in the division stunk. <laughs> yeah, for it, real. <laughs> but, but, but doggone it, they made the best of what they had. They worked <laughs> hard. They played hard. They went through the trial and tribulations with their coach and his cancer thing. I'm telling you, it's serious business down there. He, he's, he's building quite a team there. Chase Young, great player, going to be a great player. Um, they tried to make a big deal out of the thing, him saying he wanted time. What competitor wouldn't? What competitor wouldn't? We're not even supposed to be here. And I'm going to be pass rushing the GOAT next week. What am I supposed to do? Run, hide in the closet? <laughs> I su- I'm supposed to. And then, he asked, and then he asked Brady for his jersey after the game. Right. <laughs> yeah, he said he'll send it to him. He's going to send it to him. That's cool, man. See, that's cool. That's how, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. No doubt. All right. Uh, well, that's all that I got. I got one more thing. Okay, go. So remember when the Titans went to Baltimore and played the Ravens and they were all, it looked like they were having a doggone team meeting. The entire team was standing in the middle of the field on the logo. Right. John Harbaugh got upset and went out there. Right. He got in a shouting match with a couple of players and all that mess. Okay. Well, sir, Marcus Peters gets the interception to seal the game. Okay. I won't even say seal the game because there was still time left. They run, dance on the logo. Okay. They get a 15 yard unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, which, you know, the game was still kind of close. (laughs) <laughs> all right that that put him kind of a little bit bad way then Lamar ripped off two quick runs ran to the sideline 
and laid down without going out of bounds, and that was the end of that. Yes. Ed Reed, All-Pro Hall of Fame safety from the Baltimore Ravens. I love Ed Reed. I love Ed Reed. One of my favorite D-backs of all time. But he kind of came at the young boys a little hard. I understand what he was saying. I'm not going to say he was wrong. But he said, if you're going to be a class organization, you have to win with class, you have to lose with class. Win with class, you don't run and dance on their logo. I feel you, bro. But as a guy that coaches young dudes who are all basically the same age as all these NFL guys, sometimes you got to let the boys be boys. You know what I mean? I don't think it was that big of a deal. I think they deserved it. I think that the Titans didn't have to do what they did first off. That was malicious when they did it. So they got a little comeuppance. Now, running off the field without shaking hands, I'm not for that. Okay, you got to shake hands. Lamar was still upset about the other game, and he ran off. Then he ran back out to do his interviews. I don't think he shook hands with anybody. Um, so, yeah, I, I understand what Ed was saying. I have no problem with the dancing on the logo, um, but the not shaking hands thing, uh, that's not cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Um, I think that what Ed Reed did, though, was for the future. You know, let's yeah, not be I, that. I agree with you. Let's not be I agree with that, you. And he uh, said, I'm juju. extremely don't proud know. of them. He said, <laughs> that. he said, I'm really proud of my boys. Yes, yes. Awesome, yes. awesome. He just wants them to keep in mind that, you know, there's a way to carry yourself. You know, they, they have a saying in Baltimore, play like a raven. Like, they got signs up and stuff. And I, I'm sure he's that's what he's talking about. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And when he speaks, they better listen. They listen, yeah. They listen. Yeah. All right, what you got? Anything else? Wish me luck, bro. I'm going down here trying to win a national championship. With the 35-year-old group. Yes, 35 and over. Uh, we have several guys from age 35. I would say probably the core is probably from 35 to 38, and I got a couple guys that's 40 and over. Okay. We had okay. some good practices. Uh, we actually had a scrimmage against a young team, team of young guys, that's going down and playing Division Three, I think. Um, I mean, you can't really win a scrimmage, but we went 10 and 10, 10 offensive plays, 10 offensive plays, 10 offensive plays, 10, 10, and then we went game situation. So in the game situation, we each had the ball once. We got our extra point. They didn't, so we won seven to six. <laughs> but the bottom line is, these guys are all 20s. Okay. Okay. Score was okay. 76. That's awesome. That's awesome. And where is this at? What city? It's Winter Haven, Florida. Oh. It's about an hour, a little less than an hour from the Orlando airport. Okay. 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 I was at Orange Lake a couple years ago for the for my uh, a vacation, which is right outside of Orlando. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a great time. And you were telling me that they're down there in shorts and no yeah, shorts. Yeah, some of the guys are down there already. I'm leaving tomorrow. Well, I'm leaving this morning, actually. And, uh, yeah, I can't wait. They, they found a beach somewhere. I don't know where they were. <laughs> uh, they they, they might have just, you know, took a ride back to, uh, to Orlando or something. But whatever. Weather's nice. 70s, 80s. Can't wait. Oh, I know what I did want to mention, and this has, you know, since you're talking about traveling, um, right before we went, we, we went to record the, uh, I was watching the NBA channel, and the NBA is starting to struggle a little bit with people coming up positive twice. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And they've installed a number of new protocols restricting who can come into a, uh, their hotel rooms, restricting where they can go. And it was approved by their union. So, you know, the, the current atmosphere is still fraught with uh, the issues with COVID. So again, good luck, stay safe, mask up, you know, whatever it is you got to do. I tell people, Act like we did back in March and April. Yeah. Skirt. You know? Yeah. 
Because <laughs> that's about where we are right now, if not worse. Right, right. So, all right, good enough, man. Any last words? Uh, go nose. <laughs>